Right, let's get back to uh, criminal law and what we're going to look at this for this session is a few defences, like self-defence, there's a big clue behind me in case you missed it. We'll look at necessity and the two duress defences. Self-defence. The big question over self-defence is, is the force reasonable? Is the force reasonable? Okay, so what is reasonable force? Um, let's say I'm coming at you with a knife. Could you shoot me with a gun? What do you think? Is that reasonable? Is your self-defense reasonable? What do you think? I come at you with a knife. I'm saying I'm going to kill you. And you pull out a, a, a semi-automatic pistol fully loaded, safety's off, and you shoot me. Would you, have you used reasonable force? <coughs> what do you think? Silence. Come on, let's wake up. What do you think? Is it reasonable? Who thinks it's not reasonable? Mm, who thinks it is reasonable? Okay, that's a bit of, we're nearly get, we're approaching Christmas now, panto season. We normally like a bit of audience participation. Okay, those who said it was reasonable, why do you think it was reasonable? I'm not looking for a law, legal definition here. I'm just looking for a bit of conversation. Let's get this going because I, I can stand here and give you case by case and then walk away if that's what, good afternoon, if that's what you want. I just want to get this, in, get you engaged and start to think. Those of you thought it was reasonable, why do you think it was reasonable for me, for you to shoot me, I only had a knife? Because it still is like a form of defense, even though technically you shouldn't have a pistol on you anyway. But okay, let's say you're authorised to have your, your licence. Yeah. Yeah. Can a knife kill you? Of yeah. course it can. If you didn't know, I should have brought one in, We'd done a, we would have done a practical here. Right. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a lethal weapon. I will be using lethal force. So it doesn't matter if it's a gun, right? And that you shoot me with it. If you think I'm going to kill you, you can kill me back. That's using reasonable force. I know it sounds dramatic. It's not the everyday scenario when you go out at the weekend and there's a bit of a, a fight going on. Uh, that's different. What I'm talking about here, it's matching this fact, because people have this thing, guns, oh well, that's more severe than a knife. A knife never jams, a knife always gets its target, okay? And the best advice to you, if you are using a knife, just get it underneath here and then push it up. It will get the heart and then that will stop them. Yeah, but it, it, you get this lethal force. However, if I come to hit you and punch you, and you then have a, a Glock, semi-automatic pistol and you shoot me, is that reasonable? I'm coming to attack you, right? I'm very aggressive. I'm coming to punch you really, really hard and you shoot me. Is that reasonable? No. Why not? not yes, that's what it's about. I've got, if you like, open hands. I, I have no weapon. Uh, maybe if I'd punched you and then you fell over and you cracked your head on the corner of a marble table, okay, that's another factor, but that's what we're looking at. Is this reasonable? So it's using reasonable force. There's, it's Section 3 of the Criminal Law Act 1967 tells Good evening. We've, we've gone past afternoon now. It's uh, nearly quarter past. Section 3 of the Criminal Law Act says you can use reasonable force, and you can use reasonable force to prevent crime or to be effective in arresting offenders, okay? But preventing crime is if someone wants to hit you, they're gonna commit a crime and you can try and prevent it, okay? Section 76 I put up here on the slide of the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act goes into a wee bit more depth about what is reasonable and this force, it has to be reasonable. So where is the reasonableness? Well, it's what 
the defendant thought was reasonable in the circumstances. That's an important point. It's what they thought was reasonable. So we've got a degree of subjectivity now. Remember this criminal law thing. What's in the defendant's mind, it's got to be that subjective. If we have you know, the alarm clock break, Sorry? the alarm clock break or something. I started about 10 minutes ago. Come on, sit down. Try and make it on time. It disrupts the session. If it's reasonable, uh, right, where was I? You're looking at the mind of a defendant. If you're looking at the mind of a, of a defendant, you're looking at subjectivity, but of course it's not going to always be that way because we've learned that lesson with recklessness. You can't have one or the other. There's always a bit of exclusive, you know, it's not totally exclusive. You have a little bit of objectiveness and we, we will see that coming in, objectivity coming in. But it's looking at what is in their mind at the time. Now, is the force necessary? Okay, you've got to look, is the force necessary? And what is the problem here? It's not if someone's hit you, then you can hit them back. It's the bit where you think someone's going to hit you, so you preempt it, and you get the first strike in. Okay, you get the first strike in. So let's try and think of some scenarios, perhaps, where this would be obvious. Um, this weekend, I'm sure some of you will be going out to socialise and you will go to places where alcohol will be consumed and there'll be lots of people. And as happens with alcohol consumption on occasions, some people have perhaps one or two too many. And for some people, it makes them fall asleep. To some others, they become your new best friend and they can't stop telling you how much they love you. To others, it can make them aggressive. So just because someone looked at you in a funny way, you couldn't suddenly get the bottle of beer that you're drinking, pour the contents on the floor, smash the end and then put it in the face because they looked at you in a funny way. We need a wee bit more than that. However, if the other person then did get the glass bottle, smash the end of it and made a move towards you, then that is a preeminent strike if you get in first. That's what we're looking at, this preeminent strike. And this is where, in criminal law, in this country, the problems have been. Was it a truly preemptive strike? Um, then the other thing is, of course, was it a mistaken belief? Right? This is absolutely crucial. Was this a mistaken belief? There's a number of cases have been on this because this is key, absolutely key to it. Uh, there's a few cases there and I've, I've listed them for you. Uh, and how the courts have interpreted this. How the courts have interpreted this. Farage, in 2007, he used force on a Siemens worker, Siemens as, as in the company. Uh, he came to repair a time switch in the house. Farage said he believed at the time the Siemens worker was a burglar. So again, you, I think you know what's going to come next now, don't you? It's a burglar. So let's beat seven bells out of him. So he did. Uh, obviously, he's then charged with a, uh, Offences Against Person Act. And it goes to court. He is convicted. It goes to the Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal allowed uh, Farage's appeal. What was key in that was the summing up. The trial judge, I mean, bless them, it's so difficult to get juries to understand the law. If you're struggling, trying to think of 12 people who aren't doing a law degree, trying to get their heads around some issues in, in criminal law in particular, and some of the tests that are there. The trial judge's summing up was flawed because he referred to a reasonable excuse and not a legal excuse. And what they said is, the full effect can be given to the defence belief, however unreasonable it may be. But the defence, like self-defence, has its limits. So this is giving quite a wide scope. And it's giving quite a wide scope here uh, for mistaken belief. So you've got to look at the facts. You've really got to look at the facts. Would the defendant, would it be reasonable for the defendant to have that mistaken belief? I do question the Farage one, but anyway, that's just my personal view on that. Morris, in the, in, which was only a case from last year, it went to the court of the belief. Again, the court of appeal says, if it's an honest belief, 
an absolutely honest belief it does afford the defence of self-defence. It said it must equally do so when a person who claims to have used reasonable force to prevent the commission of a crime other than a crime of violence against another. What they're saying there is, again, when they talk about the crime, if someone's going to hit you, they're going to commit a crime. So where you think that crime is going to be against you, uh, but you're mistaken, then it is held to be a defence. So let's go back to my scenario where you're all out having a great time and uh, you see someone who's getting quite aggressive and they are drunk. Do you think this could change the parameters a bit? What do you think? Do you think alcohol could change the parameters a little bit? Sort of. What is absolutely crucial here is courts, uh, this is strange this because there are ju judges and barristers that do actually drink alcohol. What they don't like are drunks, right? Drunkenness in criminal law, <coughs> because you have this thing, oh, I was drunk, I didn't know what I was doing. It's no defence and if we go through different defences, a drunken uh, belief cannot be accepted. A mistaken belief that is influenced by alcohol will not be accepted. We'd have to then go to what we discussed last time, voluntary intoxication. They'd have to go for that. Remember when I discussed the going, and even a, a voluntary intoxication defence, if, if successful, it's looking at a specific and a basic offences only. So a section 18 wounding with intent, <coughs> If it is successful, they'll get a section 20 wounding where there's no intent. Uh, Hatton, Hatton, an example of this is Hatton in 2006. Uh, he decides to batter the victim with a sledgehammer. Um, if you're not too sure if that is dangerous, a sledgehammer is sort of about that big, has a rather large, very heavy metal end to it. You start swinging that about someone's skull, it will do a lot of damage. Um, Hatton said, well, I was drunk. And not only that, he was suffering from manic depression. Obviously, a Liverpool sporter upset with Brenda Rogers at the moment. Uh, he was supposed to be on medication, said, I haven't taken my medication. And it was found that his blood limit was twice the legal limit. Uh, and when you look at the legal limit, they normally use the, the drink drive one, and that's not quite high really. The course of, a, 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 a course of appeal affirmed this principle. A drunken mistake cannot uh, be relied on for the purposes of self-defence. Okay, so when you go out this weekend, just stay on Diet Coke or sparkling water, uh, just in case someone wants to attack you, and then you can preempt the strike and you're fine. Okay, so there's a top tip for you this weekend. Stay sober. Um, you mostly still have a good time. How about if the defendant instigates the aggression? Can they still use self-defense? Well, defense is keen, and it's from 2010. And they said yes. The cause of appeal said yes, but we need some conditions on this. They said if the defendant claims they thought something was happening, it's what's in their mind, what's the defendant thinking, so it's subjective at this point, what's in the defence mind, what they're thinking is happening. Now the jury might go, that was never happening in a month of Sundays, right? They, now we've got the objectivity in this. But if the defendant genuinely believed what was happening, caused the defendant to use the violence the way they did, provided that belief was a genuinely held belief, then judging on the facts, so we're going to look at the facts, okay, let's weigh that up. Let's look at the defendant's genuine belief. It, has it got to be genuinely held? Then if that's the case, that's not too bad. The next question for the jury is, was it reasonable? So let's break that down, because it's an important case, I think, this. It's this looking at this preemptive strike, if they initiate, if you like, the aggression. So you, you've got the subjectivity. What does the defendant genuinely believe? But now we've got the objectivity coming in. Let's look at the facts. Would that be reasonable? Let's look at what happened there. Would that be reasonable? If it is, they looked at me in a funny way, so I hit them. 
I don't think that would be held to be reasonable. If someone starts shouting over to someone and then starts pushing them around a little bit and it's getting quite aggressive and very, very angry uh, and the pushes are getting harder, then what do you think? Do you think that could be reasonable if you're members of the jury and the person then turns around and hits them? What, do, you, do you think that would be reasonable? Anybody not think that's reasonable? Wants a wee bit more? Do you want someone to hit them first? Well then it's not the preemptive strike. This is where the problem is. And this is the issue with self-defence. It's not a problem where someone's hit someone and they then retaliate and restrain someone. That's not a problem. It's where they get the first strike in. And normally, um, I'm sort of looking if we look at assessment wise, you will find where in an assessment for defences there will be a self-defence and it's going to be a preemptive strike. Why? Because that's the problem area. So that's what we would be asking you to assess. So have a think about this. You've got to look at that statute. Is it reasonable? Is it reasonable? And of course, this is the thing in law. What is reasonable? What is reasonableness? And the, the courts are always very careful not to be too prescriptive because each set of facts of a case can be different. Okay, can be different. So we look at those cases, we look at it, what was in the defendant's state of mind? Was it a reasonably held belief? So we've got the cases that we're looking at. Even if it's a mistaken belief, mistaken belief, you're looking at Farage, you're looking at Morris, you're looking at Hatton, and Hatton is the mistaken belief when drunk, and now we know a drunken belief is not acceptable, and if they instigate the aggression, important is the case of Keane, where you look at what was in the defendant's mind, then assess with the facts, was it going to be reasonable? And if so, the jury, the second part of the jury is, was the force used reasonable and proportionate? Okay, that is mega important. Uh, it's got to be justified, the force. And there is one case regarding mental state. Now, of course, there are gonna be people who are suffering from mental illness. Good evening. It is criminal lecture, it's not a lecture later on you're coming to it. It's nearly half ten now. Okay. There will be people who will suffer from a mental illness. And so what do we do? Do, do we assess it on the person who doesn't have the mental illness? I mean, I'm, I'm going to mention, because I know you've we've gone through the, the um, recklessness and Corwell. Remember the problem with Corwell? It didn't take into account the characteristics of a defendant, did it? It was unfair. And the courts have learned a big lesson from that. Okay, so you, you don't have to mention recklessness if you're answering this, because I'm just trying to illustrate this for you. Mar uh, Anthony Edward Martin. Um, he was a, a farmer in uh, East Anglia. Now, you may have heard about this fella. He was paranoid, absolutely paranoid, about being burgled. And of course, in the countryside, and I'm sure some of you are in the country, do come from the countryside, unlike the city, the police are not just a couple of minutes away. Uh, it can take some time. Very vulnerable, and if you're a farmer, you're out in the fields, your farmhouse, might be no one in there. So Martin set, not just a burglar alarm, but traps and all sorts of stuff in his house. He also had firearms. Well, a lot of farmers do have firearms. They have a shotgun and they normally have a license to have a shotgun. Anyway, he comes across some burglars and he gets a shotgun and they're running away. He then uses the shotgun and he kills one and injures another. You're not going to even go and say, sorry, I'm late. Sorry. Yeah, well, try and get in on time. If you're in the workplace, it'll be sucking you now. These burglars are running away. But there's also, now, there was, at the time, there was this big debate. Can you use, uh, well, not just reasonable force, but to protect your property? The Daily Mail in particular picked up on this. Isn't this shocking? He's been arrested and he's being charged and he was only defending his property. And he was only defending his property. What also came out was the amount of traps that he had. They really were incredible. Uh, it, 
they were very excessive. Also the shotgun. Now if I said a farmer has a shotgun, we normally think of the one where you can break it, the barrel down, you put a couple of cartridges in, put it back up. Yeah? This is a pump action shotgun. You know the ones you see Arnie Schwarzenegger and all those actors have in the American films and it goes clunk clunk. You put four or five rounds in. Uh, that's a section one firearm, he didn't even have a license for that. When that came out it was amazing, the likes of the mail that suddenly retracted what a hero he was to what an idiot he was. And that's the difference he did. So it is important, obviously what he did was wrong. If someone's running away, right, so let's say you find someone burgling in your house and you want to stop them and use reasonable force, but they're running away, don't chase after them with a weapon. Grab them and then stab them, batter them, whatever. They've run away. They're running away. They're no threat to you. Okay? And that was important. Something from my house. Sorry? What if they stole something from my house? And you want to get it back? Yeah. Well, you can still go and arrest them, but use reasonable force. Don't shoot them, though. What is reasonable force? That's what I've just been discussing. What's reasonable in the circumstances? If they turned round and had a knife and you had a gun, that was the whole point. Oh, you weren't here at the very beginning, were you? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's the point of turning up, so I'm not telling you. You should come up on time. Yeah, if they have a knife, turn around and you say, well, come on then, bitch. <laughs> and you go, okay, take that socket. <laughs> that's reasonable, because I can kill you with a knife. If they come on and say, well, come on then, and then you shoot them, that's not reasonable. Okay? And you say, excuse me, can I have my property back, please? You thieving bastard. Right. Are we okay with self-defense? Has anyone got any issues? Because ask now or forever hold your peace. It will be in a seminar. But get these issues right. Keep it simple. I've tried to break it down so it is that thing that we're working on. What's reasonable? If it's then reasonable, can you have a mistaken belief? And how about preemptive strikes? Well, how does the law stand on that? So the courts have tried to be as fair as they can. I've tried to be as fair as they can. Um, I mean, I, I've got, I suppose I could mention what's happening in Ferguson at the moment. That's a big issue. It's American. It's obviously it's American law, but it's interesting to see how. Oh, cheers! Pass them around. It's interesting to see how in American law, emotions can still run high. Does, does anyone know what I'm talking about? Ferguson and the state of Missouri. You know, sign that and pass that back for us. Have you seen it in the news? You're not seeing it on fire. They're all upset. And the American Bobby who did the shooting was interviewed and they've released it because uh, he's, he's, he's not been charged. He's been uh, exonerated for his actions for shooting uh, the young lad. Um, but again, it's, it's looking at was that reasonable? But it's American law, okay, so don't, I'm just trying to give you examples. But it's, you know, this, this is an issue. Is the use of force reasonable? Um, and that's what's important. A good example that also is topical, uh, Ada Belosia and Ada Bawale, who were uh, arrested and convicted for the killing of Lee Rigby. Has anyone seen, oh, you pass it back please, it's not, it's not just yours. Um, has anyone ever seen the, the, the clip uh, after they kill Lee Rigby and then the police arrive, the firearms police, Have anyone seen that clip? None of you seen it? Yeah. So they run at the police, don't they? And what do they have in the hand? Can you remember? One of them had it in his hand, a revolver. But they also had knives. Have they killed someone? Yes. Did the knives not have blood on it? Yes. So was it justified for the police to, to open fire on them? Yeah, of course it was. Of course it was. But doesn't that show you? They both survived. You, you can survive a shooting. Okay, you can survive a shooting. But yeah, that force was reasonable. That the, the, the police used on, on those two because they were a threat. They've already killed someone, they're prepared, and they, they're prepared to kill again. Okay. Right, let's move on to necessity. Necessity. Difficult defence to have this one, if you're a defendant. Uh, you've really got to show this was so necessary, it was untrue, basically. Uh, case of Rie, this is a picture of conjoined twins here. This, this is not them, uh, just a picture of conjoined twins. 
What you've got to look at, and Lord Justice Brooke laid the ground rules in the RIA from 2000. He said, in cases of pure necessity, the actor's mind, he's been talking about actor, he means defendant. The actor's mind is not irresistibly overborne by external pressures. The claim is that his or her conduct was not harmful because in a choice of two evils, the choice of avoiding greater harm is justified. And that's what it's about. It's the greater harm, avoiding a greater harm. Some action is taken to avoid the greater harm. This is what is absolutely important. Three steps, and I put them down for you in the notes. The act is needed to avoid inevitable and irreparable evil. Look at the language that's being used. Not harm, evil. Okay, so let's look at the language here. It's strong language. Okay, it's got to be something that's evil. No more should be done than is reasonably necessary for the purposes to be achieved. There's that lovely legal bit. And for, uh, just out of interest, who wants to practice when you get your degree? So let's have a show of hands. Quite a few of you. Who doesn't want to practice? What do you, what do you fancy doing? Oh, you want to be in the police? Very sensible move. Uh, and, and anyone else doesn't want to practice? Anyone else want to join the police? I've got a couple of you want to join the police? Very sensible move. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, especially those who want to practice. This is the money maker. These phrases are the money maker. This is what you go to court for. This is where you're going to challenge both ways. If you're working for the CPS in criminal law, you're going to argue it was reasonable. If you're the defence lawyer, you're going to say, that's not reasonable. Right? You're going to argue, the, and you've got to even use the same cases to argue your point. This is the beauty of law, it just keeps moving. But that one, no, no more should be done than is reasonably necessary for the purposes to be achieved. What's reasonable? That's the question we've already been asked this morning. What's reasonable? The evil inflicted <coughs> must not be disproportionate to the evil avoided. Okay, so please note this is serious stuff here. We're talking about evil. Right? And certainly, you know, if you look at biblical terms of what, what is evil, you know, there's all sorts of things that can come into your mind what is evil. So we're looking at something that's really serious that's going to happen, but it's to stop the greater evil. Right, to stop the greater, okay, we're looking for the greater good, really. Rie is about conjoined twins, and as is normal with conjoined twins, one twin is stronger than the other twin. The issue was, the weaker twin is going to die. It looked as though, medically, they were going to die. But if that weaker twin dies, it could also kill the stronger twin. So both twins would eventually die. The parents were asked, we can do a separation, says the medical staff, we'll do the separation, will you consent? Parents went, no. Okay, I think it was religious grounds, they went, no, you can't. So the court, so the medical people went to court, they wanted to get an order, they can have a declaration for an operation. They went for a court declaration and they got one. And they got one because they said it's necessary. They used the defence of necessity. They said, if no operation is done, both these children will die. But we know when we do the operation, the weaker twin will die. They knew the weaker twin would die. But we're going to give that chance of life to the stronger twin. And that's what swung it for the court. They looked at that. Okay, killing someone, in case you don't know, is an evil thing. Right, uh, and in most, even I've mentioned religion before, most religious doctrines, you don't kill people. Okay, you look at most religions around the world, most of you've been brought up somewhere, you don't kill people, it's naughty. Okay, it's the most serious offense that you can commit. And even if it's not a religious doctrine, you look at most philosophies, you don't kill people. So here's a medical team going to court and saying, we're going to kill this child. That's basically what they're saying, we're going to kill this child, but we need to do it for this one to live. So there it was. The actors need to avoid an inevitable and irreparable evil. It ticked the box. We're going to keep that child alive. Was it going to be reasonable? It looks like it was going to be reasonable. And it was not disproportionate. It's not like, oh, I'll do it blindfold and let's see if I can get it right. No, it was going to be proportionate. What they're doing was proportionate. So that seems quite straightforward. 
Um, drugs. That's the big clue. In case you're wondering, that's not a police officer going through a field uh, with, with pretty grass. It's a funny type of grass. Um, I just love it with some pensions when they go, well, it was such a lovely plant, I thought I'd grow it in my greenhouse and the rest of them. Okay. If it's got five leaves hanging off, uh, it could be a cannabis plant. This is actually, if you, if you do look at it, it's inside premises. A uh, very popular way of growing cannabis now. Uh, could be a way, perhaps, you look at your accommodations. Is anyone broke at the moment? Really broke? Yeah. Christmas is coming, isn't it? Got any prezies yet? Do you want to go out? No money? Want to go to the panto? I love it. I love pantos, me. I'm there. He's behind you. No, not yet. Okay. Yeah, and there's all sorts happening, isn't there? And you got no money. Ah. It is an hour moment, isn't it? Get some seeds, right? Um, <laughs> high intensity lamps. Go to the loft and just convert it into a cannabis farm. And sell it. For the price of a seed, a bit of water and electricity. The only trouble is the helicopters that keep whizzing round uh, can, can suss out the heat sensitive stuff. And if they see um, a very, very bright light from a roof, they've got a good idea. So you may have a knock on the door. That's the only fallback, but you could make a lot of money from it. Anyway, quail and others. Uh, I put quail and others on that one. Quail and others, three of them. That's why it's and others. If you ever see that, and oars. That means and others, okay? I know it might say simple, it's not someone's name. Three of them, they suffer from chronic pain. So chronic pain, this is serious pain. It's not just a, ow, this is chronic pain they've got. Now, they're having the, the normal medication, pills and potions, and those of you who've perhaps had some pain in the past, broken a leg, done a ligament, they give you coke codamols and they give you uh, anti-inflammatory drugs and all that, don't they? Do they work? Yeah, may do. Have you ever tried a spliff? <laughs> Apparently it works. Because if you think about it, has anyone here had um, an operation and you had some pethidine? Has anyone here had pethidine? Yeah, there was a few of us. I didn't. I, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just a normal Catholic boy, I'm, I'm innocent. You know, I, I, I didn't understand things. I had a bad injury, uh, that's a long time ago now, early 80s, just when they took leeches off you, you know, and, uh, and it was a really bad injury, long operation, and I'm in agony when you come round. Apparently I was swearing. Oh, unbelievable, couldn't fucking believe it myself. <laughs> but I, 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 I still have this memory, the pain was just excruciating. And I'm getting, and of course I'm still a bit mongified with the anaesthetic, but I'm starting to fight, apparently. <laughs> fucking off, fucking off, my fucking pain. And then the serenity. I was floating. I was in a happy place. It was pethidine. It worked, it was brilliant. Uh, the bad bit is when you start faking pain to get some more. Uh, I didn't realise I was getting hooked on pethidine. Uh, so, so those of you who had the pethidine, did that bring back memories? It's lovely, isn't it? You're like floating. I don't know if I was smiling, I felt like I was smiling. I was happy for once in my life, you know, I was happy for once. Yeah, so drugs can help, right? But they've got to be prescribed. We don't prescribe cannabis. But these three thought, right, this pain's too much, these pills aren't working, we'll grow our own. So they grew their own. They claimed this was a necessary evil because it's for our own use. We have a greater evil, our pain. It's to relieve our chronic pain. They said the drugs they were given weren't of sufficient strength. What do you think the courts said? Who's thinking the courts went, fair enough, have you got any spare? Yeah. Misuse of Drugs Act came in and said, uh -uh, no you can't. Even on a doctor's prescription, you can't do it. Doctors cannot prescribe cannabis for you, okay? 
except if it's medical research trials. So do, now, I know you're broke. There's a couple of you broke. Do look for the adverts. Volunteers needed to try these drugs. If you're broke, you will get some money. I don't know what the side effects will be. I have seen X-Men. Uh, I don't know if that'll happen. You know, you suddenly get these strange powers, but it, you know, it could be worth thinking about. So, and certainly, if doctors can't prescribe it, unqualified individuals like Quail and his two mates, certainly they can't do it either. Uh, taking it another step forward is Altham 2006. That's not a woodbine, uh, by the way, or uh, what is it, the uh, Golden Virginia Roly. That's the Lebanese Gold Roly, uh, that one there. Again, chronic pain. Uh, had surgery. And so I can relate to this, and those of you who've had surgery, certainly a long operation that was with a bad injury, you can mostly can relate to Paul of Eltham. It's fucking sore. I mean, the pain is like horrible, isn't it? I mean, even if you bash yourself, even for a short time, ooh. Uh, except if you're football, apparently you, if, if, if someone catches your leg, it affects your face. I saw that last Saturday um, when Morales went in and this West Ham player was clutching his face. But apparently it was the leg that was hit. Marvellous. How that happens, I don't know. So you know pain sore, don't you? We, we know that. You know, some go, oh, I've got a headache. Paracetamol, all the rest of it. But he's got this chronic pain. He's had the surgery. So he decided, because you know what he's done, because there's a big clues there, right? Big clues there. Uh, I will get some cannabis to relieve my pain. Because he said the NHS isn't doing a good enough job. He then claimed the NHS, the National Health Service, where Anaira Bevan stood up for it in the 1940s. I wasn't born then, okay? Of which even this coalition government says is a jewel in the UK crown. Okay, because normally you think of the NHS, you go to hospital when you're not well or you've been injured, yeah, they look after you. He says, they're not looking after me. This is true. He said, they're violating his Article 3 right. A bit of public law's creeping in here now. If you remember, that's the prohibition against torture, degrading or inhuman treatment. Do you remember this? It's not the right to torture. I will re-emphasize that. It still makes me laugh when I read it. The right to torture. It's prohibition of torture. He said the NHS were, it wasn't the torture bit. It was inhuman. Because he's in such pain, they wouldn't give him drugs of a sufficient strength to kill his chronic pain. That's why he was smoking spliffs. Cause of appeal. What do you think? They upheld it? That's a pretty good excuse. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that. Or do you think they dismissed it? They dismissed it. They dismissed it because Lord Justice Baker said there's no breach of Article 3. I've, I don't know about you, I've got this image in my head of, because they've, they've seen the defence coming, right, this, this defence. Can you see them in the judge's chambers? Can you imagine what the conversation would be like? Do you think they go, oh, I say, this seems rather fair, go, oh, get a fucking drip. And then they come out to court and go, and say it very, very nicely. Yeah, they said, we do not think the state is properly regarded as responsible for the harm inflicted. Because what's the point he's making? You operated on me, you give me this pain, give me the cannabis. Nor do we think Article 3 requires the state to take steps to alleviate the appellant's condition. Basically, it was a telling off. That's the get a grip, if you like. That was the telling off of Altham. You went for an operation, of course you're gonna suffer from an operation. You'll have other aches and pains that will go with it. I mean, if you have a heart operation and they have to, which they do, cut you open here, maybe break your rib cage, open part of it, you know, and then put it all back together again. You know, this, this thing, oh, sorry, so I've, I've just upset someone's breakfast there. I've just realized, sorry about that. Uh, if you are gonna throw up, just make sure you use a bag. Yeah, but, that, but that's the whole situation. Isn't it? Of course, if you have an operation, there's going to be other aches and pains you're going to temporarily get while you get repaired. So we got told off. No, nice try. No, but I've got to give Alfred credit for this. It was worth a try. And Article 3, a really strict one. Are we okay on necessity? It's got to be evil uh, that you're trying to stop. But you've got to use 
another form of evil to stop that evil. It's got to be proportionate and it's got to be reasonable. And the only one where you think a good example where it was successful was Rie with the conjoined twins. The cannabis examples, nice try, but no. Okay, moving on. Duress per minus. Now this can cause some problems. It is quite a straightforward defence. <coughs> and what I've tried to do here is break it down for you so you can see there's a number of steps. And you need really to tick the box on all, all, all five of the steps I've broken it down to. It's me that's broken it down to five steps to try and make it easier to understand. So it's got to, the answer's got to be yes to all five, okay? If you get a no, you won't get this defence. If, if a defendant is successful getting this, they will walk free from court. Okay, duress per minor. So what is it? It's where a defendant commits an offence, but they're doing it because of a threat that's been made to them. Okay? A threat has been made to them by another person. It's got to be another person. And the defendant's got to reasonably believe that threat will be carried out. Okay? So, we need some points to prove. The first thing I would look at is the nature I put there, nature and severity of the threat. Hudson and Taylor from 1971 is an important case in duress per minus. Still today, it's an important case because the cases that followed on still uh, confirm what was held in Hudson and Taylor still stands. The nature and severity of the threat. So let's say I came to you and said, I want you to go and rob the bank with a gun. Here's a gun. Go and rob that bank. If you don't, I'll shout at you. How about that threat? Is that severe enough? No. No, of course it's not. I want you to go and rob that bank. If you don't, I'll slap your face. How about, I want you to go and rob that bank, because if you don't, I'm going to break your fucking legs. Is this still severe enough for you? Oh, it's only got you two bright areas. I mean, the, the, the slap was iffy with one or two faces here. Going, I don't have a slap face. Okay, breaking legs. Okay, go and rob that bank or I'll kill your sister. Some people are going, yeah, that's no problem. <laughs> Bitch. Your younger sister. Because uh, I've got to check. Anybody here the youngest sister? Oh, God, it's full of them. Anyone here the eldest sibling? Uh, got, so, did you find the youngest one? Normally, sister. Was it has been a pain in the ass? Does it change when they get older? No, doesn't. Even when they're forty. I'm just me, and they go a little girly talk, you know. It's me. Right. So, except for those circumstances. Rob that bank or I'll kill your sister. Is that threat okay? Is that severe? <coughs> Do you think some conditions need to be done because my sister lives in Canada? Has that changed it a little bit? She does actually live in... Thank God, thank God. <laughs> She's in Canada. She lives in Canada. She married a Canadian. Uh, how about that then? I, I, and I'm in Liverpool and they said, go and rob that bank or we kill your sister. Okay, forget the... We, we do get on, so forget that bit. And she's in Canada. Has that changed the nature and severity of the threat? Yes, of course it has. Unless, of course, they then show me all these marvellous things like your smartphones and that. Here is a clip of her in Canada being held at gunpoint. And it, all it will take is me to either message them and go, kill the bitch, uh, and it's done. Okay, that might change it. So that's important. Can they do carry out the threat? Okay, so the nature and severity of the threat. Is it sufficient? That's what Hudson Taylor said. Is it sufficient? Examples of this is um, where, say for example, people hold a senior position in financial institutions or diamond dealers. We're talking big crimes here, uh, or serious crime. They go to work and the next thing is they find that their family's held hostage at home and there's a phone call from home and things like that, That's, that, that could be uh, part of it there, that threat to kill them. Uh, and certainly if you're going to threaten to kill my dog, I'll do anything for you, um, doesn't matter what it is, 
Well, we might think about the kids, but as soon as we're done. You've got to look at it because this is essential. Is it sufficient? The defence of duress by threats cannot be relied on if the defendant fails to take an opportunity open to them to render the threat ineffective, because that's the next thing. Rendering the threat ineffective. What do you think that is? Is it giving the one who made the threat a smack in the mouth? No, it could be. What well, overpowered him. What is it about making this threat ineffective? If I said to you, go and rob that bank next week, or I kill your family, or we will do some, or we will come round and we will kill your children. Right? And then let's say the baby children. So let's have a bit of an oh moment here. Right? Little babies, Christmas coming, they're all excited now, aren't they? Little lights on, they're all excited. Okay, so there's the kids, all excited. Someone comes up and says to you, go and rob that bank next Monday, or we kill your kids. Is there something you could do about that threat between now and Monday? Of course you are. Well, yeah. well, yes, that's what the courts expect you to do. Go and tell the police. Yeah. And you go to the police station or you can ring them up and uh, roll ring crime stoppers, whatever it is. Yeah, I've been threatened. They want me to rob this bank. They said, if I don't do it, they're going to kill my kids. I've got to do it on Monday. Have you taken that threat away? And because I, I then pass it on, I say, it's Gary Wilson, he's from Hull, and he lives at such and such address, and here's his mobile phone number. Have I eliminated the threat? Taking Gary out the game, he gets arrested? Of course I have. Of course, that's quite interesting, because if uh, we look at some criminal fraternities, do members of criminal fraternities like to go to the police and say, my mate, or he's just said, if I don't do this, He's going to break my legs, so please arrest him. Mm, they don't, do they really? In case you don't know, grasses are not very popular in certain areas of this country, or even the world. To grass to the police is worse than even committing an offence. Uh, it's, 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 it's the big no-no. Okay? So, if there is a threat, how can you negate that threat? you take steps to do it. And I'll go through withdrawal in, in more detail in a moment, okay? So it's got to be severe. Okay, there's a big clue. Guns, right? So onto your head. Right, that's a big clue. Next step. We've ticked it. Yes, it's a sufficient serious threat. Next step. Is there what they call a sufficient nexus between the threat and the crime? Nexus is quite a simple word. Relationship. Is there a relationship between the threat and the crime, okay? Uh, good case for this one, it's stood the test of time since 1994, Cole, C-O-L-E, have I put that up there? No, I haven't, Cole, C-O-L-E, 1994. This is a good example for it here. Uh, he owed money to money lenders. Uh, again, I don't mean Wonga, or those with six million percent. Have you seen those companies where you can have a same day loan? And if you look at the APR, it's really high. So we're not talking looking at them, we're talking about money lenders. They're the ones, again, about this time of year, in all seriousness, another time of year, a good time of year for money lenders. They want the money back, and they're criminals, and they will do serious harm to you if you don't pay them back. They're putting pressure on him because he's not paid back. Cold hasn't paid back, so they're putting the arm on him. You've got to pay the money back. These are serious threats he's getting. Uh, so he thinks, right, what shall I do? Oh, my benefits aren't going to cover it. I'll go and rob a Lloyd's bank. That's what we thought he'd do. So we went and robbed the Lloyd's bank. He then claimed the uh, defence of duress, per minus. Do you think he was successful? Who thinks he was successful? He thinks he wasn't. Who thinks he wasn't successful? Yes. Why, why don't you think he was successful? I mean, have a think about it. He owes money to a money lender. They said, give us the money back. Give us what you owe us. What didn't the money lender say to Cole? That he did. They robbed the bank. If they'd said, go and rob that Lloyd's bank. Get us the money that you owe us. Pay us back. Now we've got a relationship between the threat and the crime. But there was no relationship between them and Cole. So we've got to have that relationship between the... Uh, the threat and the crime. So the bit I was saying before, 
let's say you've got some managers who go to or senior figures who go to work in financial institutions or places where there's high value uh, commodities they're dealing with and they say give us that or we kill your family you must go as that now you can see there is a sufficient nexus so coal is a good case for that the threat's got to be imminent okay oh. imminent I think that's pretty imminent having a gun to your head or blow your head off you don't do this if you're struggling trust me it is imminent it's about to happen um, Hudson and Taylor again is the same case it's underpinning a lot of these here uh, Abdul Hussein from 1999 is another good example that you could use what the Court of Appeal looked at in Hudson and Taylor was an opportunity for delaying tactics was there an opportunity to delay those tactics if there wasn't and the defendant had no choice but to commit the offence because the threat was imminent then we've ticked the box so if we've got a severe threat a relationship and it's imminent so far so good we're on our way to getting this defence uh, but they've also got to know the defence got to be no no man at all this threat could be carried out and it could be carried out immediately okay it could be carried out immediately that is really important that was in Abdul Hussein course of appeal that it's got to be the defendant believes it will be carried out immediately or it's good if they try and get protection say from the police I mentioned before the okay they go to the police if they've not even got that opportunity okay, if they haven't even got that opportunity then it's deemed the threat is imminent so how about the recipient of the threat I've put some examples here uh, again Hudson and Taylor I told you underpins all these and the other cases build on it like Wright and Shayla I've covered it here in the notes the threat has got to be explicit right the threat's got to be death or serious bodily harm okay so long as we've got death or serious bodily harm remember said for or I'll shout at you in a loud voice doesn't count a slap on the face doesn't count it's death or serious injury uh, what we've got to look at for this strand Hudson Taylor, of course, Peel said, will the, will the will of the person who's been threatened be overborne? In other words, they've got to do it because if they don't do it, that threat will be carried out either on them or members of the family. Okay? So the recipient of the threat. That is really important. So let's have a look. Um, someone comes to you and says, if you don't do this, we're going to kill David Cameron. What do you think? Is that okay some of you might go just like younger sisters so have you got a relationship well I'm, I never know might have here is anyone related to David Cameron so none of you went to Eton then okay. so no one's related to it is he your best anyone here his best friend ah oh, it's not it's not looking good for him really is it this looks like he's gonna die um, yeah so you see the point no connection whatsoever right the recipient of the threat is the person who threat against sufficient I'm gonna kill David Cameron no it's not friends yeah you know, there they are holding hands they're friends apparently how about your friend your new best friend did anyone have, have one of them after induction you go you're my new best friend when you were drunk yeah. how about best friends do you think it's a sufficient relationship for that 18 years 10 years 18 18 so you've been friends for 18 years do you think that's sufficient could be there's no yes or no here let's go back to what's reasonable that lovely r word in law especially in criminal law it's like this is the money maker you see the R word, you should go ka-ching when your eyes blink, it's the money maker. You could argue, if you've had a close friendship for 18 years with a person, they'll know you better than members of your family, your siblings, your parents, your children. Some of you won't have children yet. Some of you lads may have children you don't know about yet. <laughs> That's the whole point. It could be. Is it reasonable? Ah, the family. Ah, 
Isn't that lovely? Look, there we are. A happy family. I think they're acting. I've, I've never seen a fucking happy family in my life. <laughs> Especially the extended one, you know. Anyone looking forward to having all the extended family around for Christmas? Never mind. The family. Okay, family members. I think that would be a given, really, wouldn't it? So we've definitely got sufficient relationship. Let's prove it. I think 18 years close relationship will, will definitely count. That's my, not my new best friend, my oldest best friend, my bestie bestie mate. And David Cameron, sorry David, um, no one loves you. Uh, you're not popular here. Okay, you happy with that? So we tick the box for that. So is it sufficiently severe? Yes, Hudson Taylor. Have we got sufficient nexus, coal? Yes. Is it imminent? Hudson Taylor, Abdul Hussein, yes. And have we got, take David out, a new, an old best friend who we're really close to, or member of the family? Yeah, the recipient of the threat, who's being threatened, is it sufficient? Yes. That's great. So far, so good. Here's another issue, a fifth step. This is where if you're doing defences on an assessment, you can go down Tommy Tangent Lane and away you go giving Norton rules and we talk diseases of the mind and we go on insanity. Beware. Beware. Okay. It is an issue. What's the impact on the person's mental state on how the threat is assessed? Here is a clue in assessments. They will say something like, Blethyn Davis is suffering from a minor mental condition. Okay? So they will tell you what it is. By the way, I just, that's an example. Blethyn is not suffering from a minor mental condition in case you're worried or concerned or don't give a shit really, but he hasn't. Yeah, it's, this is an, a factor. It's not insanity. It's not insane automatism. It is a factor in duress per minus. It's an objective test, okay? It is an objective test. The courts will look at this objectively. Bowen is the case, 1996. They will look at it, the it is objective, but we then need some subjectivity. Have you, have you seen how the courts have developed this now? They either have an objective test with some subjectivity, or it's a subjective test with some objectivity. This is objective with some subjectivity. They will look at the characteristics of the defendant. God, they really did learn after 1980, didn't they? They'll look at the characteristics of the defendant. And that's important. They will look at factors, and of course appeal stated here. You look at factors like age, okay? Now, there is one bit in Bowen. I don't think a judge would say this today. I really, I, or I'd hope a judge wouldn't say this today, because 1996, I'm doing my maths. 18 years ago. Scary. 18 years ago. He said, you do look at the sex, or the gender of a person, especially a woman who's pregnant, because her hormones are all over the place. I'd ignore that little bit, right, today. I think we'd struggle, and I would not like to see a court of appeal judge, or a Supreme Court judge, or a High Court, or any judge, saying, well, you've got to watch these women when they're pregnant. They're all, they're hormones, you know what they're like, they're mad, the pickles with the cake and things like that. No, uh, ignore that bit. But what's important, Bowen, you look at the characteristics of the defendant. Could be a child, could be a younger person, it could be someone suffering from some mental illness, it could be somebody who's of a weak disposition, easily frightened. Okay, you've got to look at those characteristics, it's really important. So, it's an objective test with a degree of subjectivity. Let's put some of the characteristics in. Psychiatric evidence can be admissible. It can be admissible to show that the defendant was suffering from a recognised mental illness. It's got to be a recognised mental illness or psychiatric condition. Case is Emery, 1992. Okay. So there's your five factors. I, or I've broken it down to five factors. If you've ticked yes to all five, bingo. Fireworks will go up in the court. You've been successful. You have now claimed the defence of duress per minus, and if the jury believe it, you will walk free. Okay? So, if you look at it, it's, it's a complicated defence. 
It's got these five key strands to it. I've still not finished on it yet. There's one more bit, but five key strands. And yes, they're difficult. They're difficult for the defendant to get because they're going to walk free if it's proved. Okay, they're going to walk free if it's proved. How can you withdraw? Can you withdraw from, from this? So long as you render it ineffective, okay? So long as you render it ineffective. Hudson and Taylor was important on that. If there's a, a gap, an opportunity for a defendant to have negated that threat, then they should have taken it. And if they fail on that one thing and grab the other four, they won't get the defense. Okay, remember when I said, do the bank on Monday, they have the chance to do it. How about gangs? Uh, I'm assuming everybody here is strong-willed, not swayed or easily influenced by other people. You don't get carried away with the, with the, with, with the, with the crowd, with the mob. You don't. You're your own person. Am I right in assuming that everybody in this room, you're, you are your own person. You don't get carried away. You're not easily swayed. Or are you? This is the point with gangs. I was in a gang and if I didn't do it, they wouldn't talk to me anymore. Gang duress. It is powerful. It is a powerful thing. Certainly in certain groups, locations in, in, our, in our country, in our society. A member of a criminal gang. Now, to be a member of a criminal gang now, that's got a bit more bonding, hasn't it? A bit more bonding. A bit more bonding. And they might put you under pressure as a gang member to do something, right? Guess what? Course of appeal just won't. Or I always say course of appeal because a lot of crime cases just goes course of appeal and it stops there. No, the courts will not accept that path for duress per minus. The five bits I mentioned, or why I broke down to five steps. Yes, if there was a yes on this, well, yes, you would have influenced by them. It doesn't matter. Because I don't think you joined. Have you done joint criminal enterprise yet as a lecturer? I don't think you have yet, have you? That's, that's on its way. There's another issue about withdrawing from that. It's that influence of other people. Okay? It's the influence of other people. And that can be it's twice a strong culture there, really. Um, and people get caught up in things. Okay. Anyone got any issues on duress per minus before I move on to the next one? Has that made it a bit straightforward for you to understand by breaking it down? Because that's what I think you should do in, in any assessment. Break it down to certain steps. That way you won't get tied up in nuts, go off on the wrong uh, path. It'll keep you on that straight and narrow. Okay, last thing we're going to look at, duress of circumstances. This is, was developed in the 80s. Duress of circumstances. Easily missed at assessments this. Easily missed. Um, and it's where, now what's important here, the threat doesn't have to come from a person. That's why it's called duress of circumstances. It's the circumstances surrounding it. It can come from what is termed a natural cause. Or, and also, the threat does not have to be accompanied by an instruction. Do this or else, because that's what duress per minus is all about. Conway 1988 is an example of this. He's a drink driver. And the police car is behind and they're trying to stop Conway. So Conway doesn't stop. He decides to go faster and to go through red traffic lights and fail to give way. Sounds like a good ride this one, doesn't it? He decides to do all that, to get away from the car because he thought they were criminals trying to stop him and get him. That was his defence. He didn't stop because that's what he thought. He looked at the circumstances, the time of day, what was happening and what was happening in his life. He thought they were criminals who were after him. Uh, and another case to look at is Martin. And what's important is Martin is, because obviously you can imagine this now, can't you? Did you think, oh, that's a good one. I might use that myself. Well, guess what? Martin was very strict on it. Cause of appeal held. Um, because here we are with car chases and things and lots of Jaguars, because I like Jaguars. In Martin, how the defence is only open from an objective standpoint. Okay. 
So if we're going to look to see if the defence is acting reasonably and proportionately, these are lovely words, it's the money words, reasonable, proportionate, if they're acting that way, then we're going to have an objective point of view on it. Okay, what makes sense at the time? And I think that's what's important. It's also to avoid death or serious injury. So it's a bit like duress per minus in that sense. It's to avoid death or serious injury. But it is an objective test. Martin made this very, very clear. But what about the threat itself? Where it comes from? If it's originated in the defendant's own mind, that's fine. The defendant can say that. That's what I thought at the time. This is why I'm using this defence of duress of circumstances. It's Roger and Rose in 1998 is the case. But then the next step is, it's an objective test. Let's look at it and go, is that reasonable and proportionate in the circumstances from the facts of the case? It's not a complex defence. It's very simple. And in assessments, so easy to miss. It carries a few little marks with it. It could be the difference that goes between 58 and 62, 68, 72. That's what could swing it. So uh, examples I've seen assessments in the past is, so Billy goes to the pub and buys a section one firearm because he is so frightened that Johnny is going to beat him up. There's your duress of circumstance. He buys the gun because that, and he carries the gun round with him. Okay. So it's so easy to miss in an assessment. You mostly get the self-defense bit, you'll get the duress per minus. Keep your eye out for the duress of circumstances, okay? Keep your eye. That's, that's pretty straightforward. So we look at the self-defense. What's reasonable? Oh, great question. Now you know it's the money word. What's reasonable in the circumstances? Some are pretty obvious. If I have no weapon, I come to threaten you and you shoot me, that's not reasonable. I have a knife, you shoot me, that's reasonable. Is there a mistaken belief? We looked at the cases around mistaken belief. Preemptive strike, that is a key issue. Can you take a preemptive strike? Yes, again, we're looking at what's reasonable in the circumstances. We then looked at necessity, we talked about evil. Committing an evil to stop an even worse evil. And the only case where you could really highlight that successfully was the conjoined twins case of Rie. Going to smoke a spliff because you're in pain, no. Then we looked at duress per minus and the five steps. And the five steps, just try and learn them off by heart. The nature and severity of the threat. Is the threat imminent? Is there a nexus between that threat? Okay, what's the relationship with that threat? Is there a sufficient relationship? Okay, and the mental condition of the recipient of that threat. And gangs, uh -uh, it's a big no-no. And don't forget your rest of circumstances. We will be going through this in uh, a seminar. I'm not sure which one it is, but we will be doing it. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll see you next time. <laughs>